Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, Bongshin is away today, so I have the pleasure to host Christopher Collins visiting us for the day. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, he's an associate professor at University of Ontario, Institute of Technology. He has this prestigious research chair, in the Canada Research Chair in uh, Linguistic and Information Visualization. So he bridges um, research in text, NLP, and linguistic, and research in visualization to make some most of the most amazing work I've read, actually. And I'm really, really glad you're coming here speak to us about all of those. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. So thanks for the introduction, and thanks for hosting me today. Uh, I've, been, I've known Natalie in, for basically since the beginning of my independent career, since grad school. She and I were in the same sort of generation, and um, it's great to, to be here and visit with you today. I've had a great time talking to everybody. So um, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about my research. I, I figured, you know, coming here, uh, as a visitor, it might make sense to focus on sort of what, I'm, what my main research area is, what I'm maybe most known for, which is this text visualization stuff. But I just wanted to say that this is like one area of research for my group. I'm going to be attending on Friday. Um, Steve and colleagues are running the, the visualization for touch displays workshop, and I'm going to go to that. So we do have some work in that area as well, as well as some just basic HCI research um, in addition to the visualization work. I want to talk a little bit about sort of a, a bit of a political thing, I guess, about the way that we talk about big data and visualization these days. When I started this work, uh, I was actually in this room, I think, in 2008, and I gave a talk about my grad school work back then. And I really thought, like, this was the way we were going to interact with documents. This was the future. And I thought, I think I thought back then that we were going to maybe replace reading. You know, we didn't need to read the documents. We could just visualize the documents. So we could get the information from the doc. Of course, this is garbage, right? It's not true. We need to read the documents. So what I'm here to talk about today is the fact that visualization and visual analytics can help us find what to read. So that's sort of the, the theme, I guess. The other maybe a bit um, cynical thing I wanted to mention was that when I write grant applications, sorry for anybody from the government who's watching this, I, I would say something like, you know, there's so much data, we don't know what to do with it, we can't handle all the volume of data, we need to create new solutions for this. It's a new problem, big data, big new problem. And I actually think that that's not necessarily true. And I'll walk you through a few quotes. So in 2010, with the amount of information online, it is very easy for people to drown in useless information that they do not need for their business or in their lives. If you try to absorb all the information you can find online, then you will experience social media overload. So this is 2010. But of course, we can go back a bit further and experience this from 1967. One of the effects of living with electric information is that we live habitually in a state of information overload. There's always more than you can cope with. And this is actually the coining of the term information overload, uh, Marshall McLuhan. Let's go back a bit further. 1755, as the centuries continue to unfold, the number of books will grow continually, and one can predict a time will come when it will be almost as difficult to learn anything from books as from the direct study of the whole universe. It will be almost as convenient to search for some bit of truth concealed in nature as it will be to find it hidden away in the immense multitude of bound volumes. Information overload is not a new problem. <laughs> we have reason to believe or to fear that the multitude of books which grows every day in a prodigious fashion will make the following centuries fall into a state as barbarous as the centuries that follow the fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> How's this for drama? If I had this in my grant applications in the 1600s, I probably would have been funded. I would say don't panic, right? Solutions have been coming up just as much as the problems have been described. 1551, utility of lexica comes not from reading it from beginning to end, which would be more tedious than useful, but from consulting it from time to time. Here, lexica is talking about uh, like a, a dictionary, like something you would look up the word in, right? Tools for dealing with information overload. So things like an index, cut and paste into the literally into the back of the volume, right? So these are solutions that people were coming up with about how do we manage these volumes of information. The greatest secret is to make different marks for different kinds of passages, crosses, circles, half circles, numbers, letters, and other characters, which had various meanings one assigned to them. 
And this Charles Sorrell quote, talking about personalized annotations that will help us understand information. So things like this. So I would say the real problem is not and never has been the wealth of information. The problem is the lack of appropriate tools for filtering, collaboration, exploration, and annotation. The pace of information dissemination exceeds the pace of tool and technique development. We are always catching up. And that's just from me today. <laughs> so solutions have been around, and people have been trying to address this problem for a long time. Beautiful solutions. In fact, visualization has even been used. This um, Clarence Larkin uh, sketches, beautiful sketches of uh, religious prophecy. Uh, this is called Mountain Peaks of Prophecy from 1918. We can't really create this kind of like literal rendering of texts right now, but the automatic renderings are going in the same direction, right? So trying to illustrate something about what's happening in a long text. The visualization community, some of these are mine, some of these are from my colleagues, have also been creating solutions that approach the problem of large amounts of text and document data. What types of language data are we talking about? So questions like, how do we understand culture and society? How do we understand what's happening in um, Twitter and Wikipedia and these kind of resources? Digital humanities research. I'll talk a little bit about my work with poetry. Reflecting on internal reports and communications within a, an organization. Legal data. So we work sometimes with uh, court cases or document discovery. So uh, looking at, for example, the Enron email was a classic example of that. How do we, know, like, how do we mind sift through that for legal purposes? Customer engagement. Uh, and then I think an interesting open challenge is how do we relate free text comments to other sorts of data that are not textual? So with credit to Marty Hurst, just take a look at this. So what document was there? What did you see? Oh, you. It is, it is, it is, it is. <laughs> so Natalie ruined the trick question. Sorry. The answer you were supposed to say is it looks like Goldilocks and the three bears, bears and sleeping. And, but actually, you're right. It is um, to be or not to be, the, the nunnery scene from the soliloquy. So what I would say here is that the sort of word cloud type visualizations that you're most familiar with, this, they're not the replacement for reading, right? These unassociated words just stuck all together here are not really, yeah, the bear. <laughs> Yes. Bears and sleep, yeah. Um, out of context, you don't really get the kind of uh, feel for the text that you really need. But we still have this problem, right, where we have all of these um, texts that we want to figure out a way to deal with. What types of texts are we talking about? Multiple different types of corpora, so uh, multiple collections of data, um, document collections, clusters, and all the way down to the individual letters and the way that they're formed, the typography. We have a whole scale and range of things that we can look at. Uh, and we might also have metadata about each level. So there may be multiple versions of a text. There may be annotations on the text. There may be something about where it was written or when it was written or the language behind it. Um, what I'm interested in and what I think is possible for, in terms of finding what to read is to use one of these levels to become the visualization or reference to get into the level below. So we might visualize a document collection to help us find which documents to read. We might look at a document visualization to try and find the key sentences and phrases. So we can use it to sort of go down and up and down this um, uh, pyramid. So I'm going to use this as a framing for some of the projects that I'm going to tell you about today. So the first one, looking at document collections, going down to finding documents. I'm using document here loosely, and in this case I'm actually going to be talking about social media posts, so, so Twitter. Um, this project in collaboration with a few other universities and companies, um, led by a PhD student who's now a researcher at Autodesk, Jian Zhao, um, it's called Fluxflow. And here what we were interested in was can we detect rumors on Twitter? And here rumors being, is sort of loosely um, misinformation or anomalous information that doesn't follow a normal flow of information. Um, so for example, some of these are true and some of these are not true with relation to the London riots. Misinformation can be characterized by, a, our hypothesis, I guess, was that misinformation could be characterized by, very, uh, by different features uh, of the tweets and of the dynamics of those tweets. So we created a system that uh, gathers Twitter uh, uh, data from the fire hose, creates data sets, and then um, classifies them and creates a visual interface for analyzing um, uh, the Twitter data. So specifically, we used a one-class conditional random fields um, classifier. And the one-class nature of this is that we don't have actually annotated data. We don't know like, what's actually um, a rumor and what's not when we're feeding it into the, to the training. So we're actually just looking for the outliers, what, are, what is not like the others. 
And then there's a high time dependency because the Twitter data is always flowing in. Our feature set um, to find anomalous tweets was based on a variety of different types of features, 239 dimensions in total. And what I thought was interesting about this was that we used not only things about the content of the tweet, but also the relation between the content and the user. So um, to put it more um, in a may maybe more understandable way, is there, does the tweet in its retweeting thread illustrate a an unusual dynamic. So is it growing in a way that's not normal for tweets? And maybe is it also being retweeted by people who don't normally retweet that kind of language? So is, the, or is there a mismatch between the language itself and the users and their past um, behaviors? So here's like an example of some of the, the, uh, the types of features that we have for every, uh, every tweet. Um, so the retweet threads, so this is one tweet being retweeted, and we're looking at who's retweeting it and when are they retweeting it. We built the classifier on this, and then we give a ranking to every instance of that retweeting um, based on how anomalous it is. Uh, and then there's some um, uh, hidden states in the model, which we use to sort of diagnose the quality of the, of the classification um, in the back end. So what we get is this. This is a, a, a single tweet. Uh, and all, every um, circle here, it's following sort of a visual sedimentation kind of technique. Uh, every circle is an instance of retweeting of that tweet. And I'll walk you through uh, the glyph representations here. So from the beginning and end of the time of our, of our span scanning Twitter, uh, we have these little clock uh, widgets that show you how long was this one active um, for. Uh, the actual color in the center is a sentiment score that's given to the tweet. And then the size and uh, color of the outer piece shows the anomaly score being low or high and how much volume there was. So for example, on the top here, we have a lower anomaly score and lo lower user volume. And here's a higher anomaly score and higher user volume. And you can see when things become anomalous, uh, it sort of uh, happens later in the, like, in the dynamics of it. So this is available to play with online, but I'll just walk you through a few screenshots of it. So the, class of the, the classifier gives us uh, some additional information. So for example, we can look at why are tweets similar to each other based on the classifier. Um, so here, uh, let's see, I got to pop out here, I think. So this is a, a multidimensional scaling view of uh, the feature space of the tweets scaled into a view that allows us to see um, which ones are similar to each other. Of course, with this kind of a view, you don't get the details about why are they similar to each other. You have to explore that for yourself. So again, looking at the tweets themselves to try and investigate why are they similar. Um, uh, but this sort of uh, dashboard approach lets you see um, some of those details. So we also provided a hierarchical clustering. So you can see tweets that are similar to each other eventually get um, clustered into groups. And um, uh, you can also look into the details of the classification scheme. So the features themselves on the raw level um, the states uh, of the classifier, and then also read the tweets themselves. So the reason we're providing all of this data is because this is a hypothesis generating tool. Because something is being surfaced on this visualization as being an anomalous tweet, that doesn't mean it's a rumor. It could actually be that there's a natural, natural disaster or something's happening, it's actually true, but it's just anomalous and you want to investigate why. Um, we also looked at the user dynamics. So uh, how are that one of the sort of uh, following relationships between people. Um, and one of the characteristics of an anomalous tweet is that people who are retweeting it are not actually following each other uh, highly. There's not a high, lot of, high amount of interconnection. So to evaluate this, we ran a study where we looked at um, uh, data sets of Twitter captured during Hurricane Sandy and during the Boston Marathon bombing. And we ran them through two different classifiers with the visualization tool. and uh, then we ranked the top 500 abnormal tweets based on whether or not they were rumor or true uh, for each of the models. And what we found was that the last ranking was hand ranking. Hand ranking of 500 of the top from each of them. So we found that the, the one class conditional fields uh, classifier, you know, for the Hurricane Sandy case, the top, the first one it gave, we ranked, the, you know, our annotators agreed that it was anomalous. And as we go out, we actually still maintained about a 40% accuracy. Um, in the top uh, 20 uh, from the system. Boston bombing was less successful. But what you'll see here is that, generally speaking, the accuracy rates are quite low. And these are sort of state-of-the-art classifiers for trying to detect with a whole lot of features about dynamics and about linguistics and all these things. And we're still only getting like a maximum here of around 40% accuracy, much lower on the Boston bombing case. 
And what my argument would be is that this is showing the need for the interactive visualization to help people investigate whether or not something really is anomalous or not. Right? So we could provide them with just a, a list of the top uh, 500 tweets, and they could just read through them. But, it, but with our tool, you can actually start to investigate what is it that makes it anomalous. Is it anomalous because of the dynamics? Is it anomalous because of the language? And you can get a drill into that a little bit. We've got a couple of other projects. Um, these are, this one's a more undergraduate project uh, where we're looking at sentiment analysis in Twitter. So here we were looking at things like uh, state of mind analysis. For example, we did a, bit, a few case studies of people who were um, shooters, like in a, in a mass shooting, looking at their social media feed leading up to that. Um, and so emotional profiling, psycholinguistics, those kind of questions. Um, looking at tweets over time um, categorized with an emotion lexicon. So our sentiment analysis here is not very uh, sophisticated. Like I said, it was an undergraduate project, but it's, a pro it's something I'm interested in pursuing in the future. So here's an example of one of those um, where we're looking at now, uh, each of these is one of the emotional states, and you can uh, filter out various different emotions and look at only the tweets that express anger, only the tweets that express happiness um, by filtering this out. So that's the work we're doing on social media. Uh, I'll move on now to talk a little bit about uh, car accident reports, so changing directions completely. What, uh, another area that I'm interested in is sort of creative uses of, uses of visualization to look at documents in a new way. So in this example, we're looking at 600,000 car accident reports from the US National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And we're turning them back into a rendering of a car. So sort of a different way of looking at text visualization. So if you imagine the word cloud or the Wordle uh, diagram, where you just have the words splatted on the screen, well, we're taking the meaning of those words and mapping them back onto the rendering of the car. So things like uh, we generated an ontology of car-related terms using you know, uh, bootstrapping from Wikipedia and other resources to try and get, um, so for example, things like part of relations, what's part of a, uh, what's part of each other, and then uh, realizing synonyms and spelling differences. And then we also had to remove some things. For example, first, second, third are gears, but they're also, when people have a car accident report, they say, first this happened, next this happened, third thing this happened. So those are not necessarily parts of the car in those cases. Which also brings up the challenge that I'll talk about at the end of the talk around uh, one of the issues with this work is that we're relying on the quality of the linguistic backend and sometimes there's still issues with that uh, where the sophisticated language processing either isn't possible or isn't accessible and there's a whole, there's like a, a skills gap and, and there's like a bunch of other reasons, pragmatic reasons why it's difficult to do. So uh, we're taking these car accident reports, each of them um, resulted in an injury or a death and they're free text, they're a paragraph or two long and parsing them to pull out the types of car parts that are involved and uh, we created a, a database of, those, of, the, of that information. The rendering is done in a way that uh, represents the values of uh, how often the car part is occurring in the accident reports from low to high using a color scale. And if it doesn't occur at all, we provide this sort of ghosty outline um, in order to give some context. So the resulting uh, view looks like this. This was published in um, 2012. So here uh, we have, uh, again, being able to drill directly down into the actual documents is really important. So exploring the space with this lens, seeing the more opaque and red uh, items are mentioned more often in this time period for this particular car. For our study, we masked out the names of the manufacturers to prevent some bias because we were trying to ask people to make car purchasing decisions based on safety records. We didn't want to bring in their personal feelings about car brands. Um, and then here, uh, details uh, over time uh, of each of the different parts of the car. So, oh, I forgot that that was there. So this is all designed for um, a touchscreen display and the lens in particular um, was used for that. So there are too many car parts to display all the detailed time varying information. So you just see whatever is inside of your lens at any given time. And you can use the lens to actually drill in and cut away um, part of the car as well. I think that's the, so there are six more that aren't even seen here. So that's part of, that's what that is. So you can sort of drill in. So we were able to do things like, uh, for example, here, this is uh, Toyota cars uh, over time. And you can see, of course, there's a giant spike in 2010. I don't know if you'll remember, but uh, there was a big concern about the 
uh, brake and pe the, about the accelerator pedal and the the, mat, uh, the cars accelerating in without control uh, in 2010, and there was a recall. Uh, one of the interesting use cases for this is that every single one of these car accident reports is read by all of the manufacturers because they need to be able to predict whether or not a recall is necessary. And this is one of the data sources that's used for that. But they don't have the tools like this to give them big picture overviews of temporal trends in the, in the, um, in the data. So again, I'm not suggesting that the car manufacturers could use this and stop reading them, but this might be useful as an augmentative tool. So here, we can clearly see that you know, the accelerator pedal is such an outlier that it's the only thing that's showing up um, pretty much uh, in these Toyota cases. And you can read the data here about um, accelerator pedal and brake pedal. And it's pretty scary, some of, the, some of the information that people were providing about what happened. Whether or not, just to be clear, whether or not this would have been actually predictive or not earlier is unclear to me because I actually think that this big spike in 2010 of reports is partially driven by the fact that people found out that there was a problem, right? So I think that people were reporting the problem more because they, they heard about it on the news. Um, but I don't know, that's just a hypothesis. So what else could we do for this? So I was actually just thinking about this last night. I was in the hotel, very nice hotel, but this morning I was woken up by the fact that there was too much light in the room. The curtains were terrible. You can, the, they weren't room darkening. And I would sit at my report, you know, the curtains, are, the curtains are terrible. If I was mining, if I was a hotel owner and I was mining the reports, this might be a nice way to look at like a model of the hotel room and see what are the things that people are complaining about the most. Um, same thing with product reviews, right? What parts of the product are awkward or difficult? Um, and I think that the same technique, we called it non, uh, descriptive non-photorealistic rendering. So describing um, what people are doing um, could be applied. Yeah? With the car complaints, it seems like it'd be pretty easy to mine out and say, oh, the brake pads are not working because it's inherently a complaint. But with hotel reactions, it can be great or it can be too hard. How do you mine out the positive from the negative? Yeah, and actually with the car complaints, it's the same problem. So in the car, um, sometimes they'll say things like uh, the accelerator pedal was wasn't was stuck and I couldn't stop, but then I pulled up on the parking brake and I was saved. You know, um, and there was actually and but we're currently counting them both as being bad. Um, so there there's a linguistic nuance that needs to be solved. I don't think it changes the visualization technique, but it brings some question into the conclusions that people would make with it. Like absolute value, yeah. right? Instead yeah. of adding a negative or a positive. To yeah. It. So I think that with a more sophisticated language model behind it, we could probably get tease out some of that. But of course, there's a lot of nuance to the way that people write reviews. Humor and sarcasm and like uh, short improper grammar. Like there's a whole bunch of problems. But yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, please. How do you identify these features of products? Do you just use like mind those noun phrases and all of them as features? Yeah, so we built, uh, for the car case, we built, we went through several iterations of building a, a data, a hierarchy basically of car parts and the various different ways in which those car parts are named. Um, and we used, and we just grabbed them basically. Uh, you, we used stemming on the text and we looked at all the occurrences of those terms. So for a new data, for a new application of this, say for hotel rooms, you would have to uh, manually or somehow bootstrap an automatic generation of a data of, of what you were interested in. You could probably, I mean, there are ways we could do this, right? We could take, if you took hotel rooms and contrasted them against, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, against all the different reviews of different types of products, you could pull out what are the words that are said about hotel rooms more often than other products in general, and that might give you the hotel keywords that you could start with to build your, your data set. Uh, for the car models, did you generalize the 3D model itself, um, or did you have different models for all the mates? We didn't. We just generalized the 3D model, but that would be something that would need to be done as well, I think. Yeah. Part of our problem there was trying to find 3D models that were segmented, um, that gave us like all of the different named parts, and we had to do that ourselves, and it was a lot of work, so we only did it once. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if you were if you were like a hotel owner, you would want to see at least your um, gen generic look of your hotel's rooms, probably. So there would be a bit of customization that would be required, I think. Um, some of that's data access. Like I think a product, you know, if you were, if I was doing a this for Microsoft Surface, I could probably get access, I assume, to the sch schematics for Microsoft Surface, right? But we just did, did whatever open data we could find online. Yeah. Some of the, how would you represent noise? It's a noisy room, or if it's. A it's interesting. Yeah, I haven't really thought of that, but. Um, what we did in another project was we took those kind of abstract terms and we made the word cloud next to it. <laughs> but I'm sure there are better ways. 
uh, for some words like noise, there might be metaphorical ways to represent it. But we just used, uh, for those ones that we were specifically interested in, we, we used them as an adjunctive view on the side. OK. Um, I'm probably going to go long, so I'm going to probably skip over some stuff. Uh, this project I only want to speak about briefly because I actually spoke about it years ago, but I thought I can't miss it if I'm going to talk about finding what to read because it's one of my favorites that I did. Um, here we were looking at trying to find court cases that are of interest in a, in a topic called forum shopping. So the U.S. court system is broken up into various different divisions, uh, roughly based on geography, the circuit, the circuit courts or federal courts. Um, and here we were looking at uh, pulling out the important parts of the text, and in particular, we were looking at expectation statistics. So this is sort of what I was hinting at just now about how to detect words that are distinctive for hotels. We were looking at um, not using word counts, but expectation measures. So whereas a word count for something like Shakespeare might give you these words, and a word count for Macbeth might give you the same words, if you take Macbeth difference from the rest of Shakespeare, you get words that are more distinctive of Macbeth. So we're looking here at words that are distinctive for particular, automatically detecting words that are specific to a court, a court division and trying to see are the courts different from one another in the types of cases that they see. So the design of the visualization is based on columns that give you for one for each court. And this could be any faceted data set. So it could be one for each author. It could be one for each type of document um, in your organization. It just happens to be courts in this case. Um, the si we did the order as alphabetic to, pr to um, support visual search uh, down the column, but you could reorder it based on size. It also, the nice thing about the alphabetic ordering is that it means that adjacent columns have a variety of sizes and they fit together a bit closer. Um, and uh, the size is the significance of the difference. So we found in our first iteration, um, it looked like this, where we had a bunch of proper nouns. And this was a nice sanity check, actually, because it's sort of what we expect. In the court district where Vermont is, we expect Vermont. We expect the names of the judges. Um, so we removed all that stuff because we want to get to the words that are um, more uh, contentful. This is just a prototype image. It's showing actually stems. We reversed the stemming to actually show the full words uh, in the display. So words that occur in multiple columns, we put these little edge stubs to represent that maybe this word or that this word occurs in something over here. And you can hover on it to see the uh, relationship. So this term uh, is a coal mining disease that occurs in two different court districts. So, you go back to the yep. so the fact that plaintiff uh, occurs in the first, second, uh, and the sixth one, mm -hmm. it's there precisely because it doesn't, it, it's not there in the third, fourth, and the seventh. Exactly. Third. It's there, well, it, it may be, be it, it's less expected in those other ones. And because it is uh, looking yeah. at the overall, overall abnormal expectations. Right. Okay. So, um, there's a, a detailed tooltip that you can pull up and you actually get a histogram of the occurrences across all the columns. Because that was one thing that we were challenged with is that if it's not here, you know, is it not here because it's zero or is it not here because it's really low expectation, like lower than expected. So representing lower than expected was challenging here. We tried it with colors to show like higher as black and lower as red, but that was confusing. So we just left out the lower. So uh, what did you do with stop words because I saw a lot of like pronouns over there and like... So we didn't remove stop words uh, from the, uh, sorry, I'll just let this play while we talk, maybe. There, OK. We didn't remove stop words from the data uh, because stop words could actually be meaningful potentially for uh, particular, like if stop words were higher in one district than another, because of the way we did our expectation measure, that means that they're really significantly different in their occurrence. And that might be interesting from a linguistic point of view. So we left them in. What we did remove were words that were common across all districts. So words like attorney or justice, those would be taken out because they were, we, we call them dynamic stop words. They were words that weren't meaningful in this domain. Um, so they were never distinctive. And so those, those you detected automatically? We detected those automatically in a pre-processing step and removed them before we even started. Because okay. their distribution was too uniform and too high. What we're seeing here is, again, getting into that drilling down into the documents data. So these are coal mining related uh, disease terms. And I don't know what just happened there. It's an old video. But um, the mini bar charts are each of them is a case and the number of occurrences of those terms in the case. So you can drill right down into concordance lines to look at the occurrence of that term in the case and then actually pull up the case um, and read it. We found interesting things. So for example, um, Things like ostriches in the Seventh Circuit. So I was really confused about why we were getting so many ostrich-related terms um, in this, in this uh, district. It actually relates to a, a, 
a Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian and American sort of dual citizen who was arrested in, the, in Florida. Um, it's actually, it's not about ostriches, it's actually an instruction that justices give to the, to the jury to say you can't, the, it's not a defense to stick your head in the sand and ignore the law, basically. But again, this sort of motivates the reason for including domain experts in the team. I didn't know that, but when we showed it to the people at Harvard who we were working with, they, in the legal department, they, they knew right away. They're like, oh, this is... But what they were interested in, though, was why is this being used more often in the Seventh Circuit than other areas. So is it something about the legal clerk is sort of put, inserting this into the decisions as they work? Or is it a particular judge? We also found things like uh, there's one district where there were a lot of really unusual terms. And apparently, as soon as they looked at it, they said, oh, that's so-and-so judge um, who's notorious. And we all hate him because he uses all these crazy terms that nobody else uses. <laughs> um, in terms of forum shopping, we did find that there were things like regional differences in the types of drug words that were showing up um, with methamphetamine in the, in the West Coast and other narcotics more in the East Coast. Uh, and again, this is again another hypothesis generating tool, right? So I don't know if this is because these drugs are more common in these districts or because they're prosecuted more highly in these districts. Okay, so moving on back to more recent work. So. Uh, here we're looking at uh, what we call multi-word collocates, so looking at a phrasal level. And in particular, uh, I've been involved in the last couple of years with my colleague Julie Thorpe, who's a security researcher, in an investigation of passwords. And it's been really fascinating, uh, fun research to work on. So we all write passwords every day, multiple times a day. You probably, I hope you have a collection of different passwords you use for different websites um, and different um, you know, technology that you need to get into. Many of us will write passwords, hopefully not like this, but these are the kind of evocative passwords that people do write. So it's been an interesting experience. We've been mining and looking at the language of passwords from the point of view of released hacked data uh, that we've found online. So we haven't done any of this, like finding the data, but we've certainly made use of the data to understand about the security implications primarily. But then also there's an interesting sociolinguistic fallout of this to help us understand something about how people write passwords. So these are very evocative, right? Uh, people say things and we don't really know why. And I always want to meet these people that we're studying in this data, but we can never get access to them. Uh, I don't know if Jim, you know, if they ever fell in love, um, but I hope so. <laughs> so the evocative nature of this data actually um, it led us to investigate this just to create some fun tools to play around with. What, you know, what types of words do people use in passwords? The implication here is do the patterns of words represent security vulnerabilities, right? So if, P, if we can find semantic patterns of words that go together, we could hopefully create a better, or uh, unfortunately maybe, create a better password guessing um, system, attack. Uh, and then the third thing would be like around what do passwords tell us about security, about society and culture. So um, in the work I'm talking about now, we looked at a data set of 32 million passwords from a particular website. Uh, we have more data now that we've, we continue to gather this data, so we've got a bigger sample. Uh, one of the uh, threats, I guess, to the validity of this work is that we don't know a lot about the actual users. So we don't know about where they were or what language they spoke or any of those things. This is an English-speaking website, so we can assume at least most of the people were English-speaking. Um, we categorized, we broke the passwords into their, in, into their com constituent components using a language model where we looked for the most likely sequence um, using the uh, 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 corpus of contemporary American English as a reference. And then uh, parsed those results to find a sort of a grammar of, a semantic grammar of passwords. And then we created a guessing system based on this. So we have a few visualizations that you can play with. Um, I think I have this one open here in a tab. Uh, yeah, so uh, these, this is, oh, I think I'm going to click something. I put a filter on it. Oh, here we go. So uh, we can look at um, this G squared measure here is the difference between passwords and uh, regular English. So the number of times a term occurs, so this is that expectation measure that I showed you about Macbeth and Shakespeare, same measure here. So if a word is high here, it means it occurs unexpectedly high in passwords compared to normal English. And uh, this was surprising to us. 
And not only love, but like every form of the word love is super high on this list. Um, uh, the short terms are there. Baby was, I think, here, yeah. So love and baby are really big. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. Baby girl, baby girl. Yeah, so we've got. <laughs> so you can uh, feel free to pull this up and explore it yourself. Let me go back to my slides. We found an interesting thing here uh, in terms of like the amount of love. So I love you, I love, I love me. Then we found number sequences, of course, like, what is it, one, three, four, three or something. Um, We also found um, place names, male names. Uh, profanity was very common. So in traditional security research, you would bring somebody into the lab and say, you know, you're being observed, but your data will not be connected to your identity. Please make a password in this system. And they don't use profanity. Even though they know, they're, they think maybe it's a trust issue. But uh, in real passwords where there's no threat of observation, people use profanity much more than in, expect in, in expectations from, from studies, previous studies. Um, people love male names four times more common than female names for some reason. So I don't know what that says about who's creating those passwords, but it's interesting. Um, animals. So we used one of our previous visualizations to look at the distribution of animal terms in um, so here, these are all the different animal terms that we detected. Uh, butterfly was huge, puppy, baby, kitten. Um, some of these are synonyms for other things, but Longhorns is probably a uh, sports team, actually. Um, dolphins, but not really ugly animals, necessarily. We also turned this around and created uh, a password guessing algorithm that, at the time in 2014, was the best uh, on certain statistics in the world. So we got um, a pretty um, successful paper in NDSS on this, and also some um, good press coverage. Uh, this article is worth reading. Uh, we helped with the New York Times on uh, New York Times Mag Magazine, where they actually go and find some people and talk to them about their, uh, the reasons why they made their passwords. So they get, the reporter got more in depth with the, with the stories behind some of these. So we also looked at number patterns. This is what I was talking about, one, four, three, four, four. Uh, I think it's I love you. What's the rest of it? Does somebody, anybody remember? There's two more words anyways. It's a sequence that actually represents, uh, it's again, I love you. Um, yeah. Oh, I love you very much, sorry. I have it here on my slide notes. I love you very much, one, three, one, four, three, four, four. Who knew, kids these days, I didn't know. Um, if we looked at, uh, if we look at time, so there's, this is uh, over time. So these are the dates of the year, these are the actual passwords, and these are the decades and the years. Um, so this is a, an analysis of uh, six to eight number sequences in the, in the data. And um, we found things like uh, in 2010, uh, we see a bit another anomaly where we see 90210, uh, <laughs> where it's actually thinking it's a date. Um, but we've got some really interesting um, evocative things coming out as well. So here, looking at 20, uh, 2001, and we've got uh, uh, 0911, uh, Twin Towers, um, there's also, uh, I think there's one here that's New York, NY 9-11, yeah, yeah. So there's a few different um, things in here. We also found things like number patterns that relate to holidays are very common. Do not use Valentine's Day. It's the most common holiday that people use as their password, which again relates to the love theme. Um, a lot of it is actually people, these are not dates and they're just co coincidental patterns that people are just lazy, the same as people who write password 123, well, they just go 010101. Um, so uh, we also found, of course, that uh, you can see here on the decades view, the most common decade in this whole data set is the 90s, uh, and we think that relates to the age of the users of this data set uh, that created this data set. So people are using their own birthdays as their passwords. Again, that's just a hypothesis. We can't confirm it. Okay, so continuing on, just bear with me, I need another few minutes. <laughs> Let's look at, um, I just hinted at this. This is another older paper, but I just wanted to briefly introduce it because I want to show you a new use case for it. So this is looking at the details of an individual document. 
Here we took um, a document and a collection of uh, a lexical uh, database called WordNet that organizes words into their um, meaning structure, so their relationship. Something is a something else, so chair is a type of furniture. We take the words from the document, we take the ontology from WordNet, we put the two together and we create this graph. Where as you go from the inside out, you go from general to more specific terms, and the darker the green, the more commonly occurring in the document. In this case, it's hierarchical, so it's propagating upwards to give you a summary. Uh, the recent research we've been doing on this, which is, I said in submission here, but we just found out this morning that it's been accepted, so I can show it to you. <laughs> uh, it's going to come out in the uh, InfoVis conference in, uh, later in the year. We've been looking at ways to abstract uh, the docuverse view or trees in general, hierarchies in general, to show you parts of the, these are hierarchies that have data associated with them about each node, so each node has a number associated with it, to show you an overview. So the traditional way of looking at this, remember dark green is important. Uh, you'll, the traditional way is how many levels of the hierarchy do you want to see? So here we have four levels, five levels, six levels, seven levels. We've got more data. Our new system is taking, is using information theory. I don't want to get too much into the details of it because it's not out yet, but I just wanted to show you a little preview. To try and isolate what are the important subtrees and show only those. So we're trying to use the same amount of space to sort of highlight the important parts. So here we have um, similar, actually lower number of nodes, but we've got some branches are opened up more deeply. So we're exposing now the dark green terms more quickly um, within, within the, the drill down navigation. So by the time we get out to what was equivalent to the fifth level, we've got about a third of the number of nodes available as we have up here, but I would argue that we have a lot more of the salient information that's currently visible. And this was just to be clear, this is all done automatically. So I have a use case for this. Everybody, is people familiar with um, Feminist Hacker Barbie? Yeah? This book. Okay. So if you're not, I recommend you look it up. It's pretty fun. So we were interested in um, my student, uh, Rafael Vera, who's working on this project around the tree cuts, was interested in an application demo for this. So we looked at Hello Barbie. We had access to all of the language that Hello Barbie says. It's a new talking Barbie doll. Uh, and here we're looking at, uh, um, this is the original view, and then he's going to switch it over to the uneven tree cut, which should expose um, some of the terms that Barbie is using. I think. There we go. So um, we can see now uh, you know, some of the branches that have the more highly occurring terms are exposed. Barbie talks about her friends and animals, um, having fun, uh, going shopping, um, food, etc. So uh, when he zooms in here, I think there's, let's just watch for a second. So we'll look at cognition related terms. So there's a pivot operation here. He's isolating that subtree. So within this cognition, um, fashion is very high as a term for cognition. She's always trying to change the conversation back to fashion. Let's talk about clothes and fashion. I think fashion. Let's talk about fashion. What about fashion? Um, you might talk to her, and then she changes the topic back to fashion. Um, if you drill down deeply, you can find that there's a little bit of math and physics in here and a chemistry you mentioned as well, um, three lines. Uh, She does think math is cool, though. She likes math. So this is a progress, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think Mattel learned their lesson. And good for them for making this data open, actually, um, for people to access and understand. I think it's important for parents to be able to uh, know what, what this is going to be saying. So Barbie's favorite color. Barbie actually never mentions any other colors. Red and gr green is for Christmas. And then pink and red are her favorite colors. Uh, and here, this is, I'm just choosing a specific sense of the word. So person-related terms. And what we were interested in here was what kind of occupations and things is Barbie talking about? Um, sorry, I should have accelerated the, oh, I think it's here. So she talks about her parents, teachers. Um, different kinds of occupations that she might want to do or that the person might want to do, uh, the child might want to do. Uh, princess is really big. 
much bigger than scientists, unfortunately. Um, Just to clarify, the farther out it goes, doesn't mean it's less important. No, it's more specific. Okay. Yeah, in the word net ontology. <laughs> we had to go pretty deep to find. So the size is, is uh, double encoded. So um, smaller things are also smaller in, the, in their space here. I think so there's a few more things uh, just uh, here. Let me see. Yeah, that's interesting at least. So I wanted to be fair to Mattel. Actually, this is, I thought, well, there's a lot of shopping here. And to go back to the theme of finding what to read, if you actually look at the terms, some of it is about shopping, but a lot of it is about if, if the child's family owns a store. So you, they say, like, what do your parents do? My parents own a pet shop. She can talk to you about your parents owning a pet shop or a, what other kind of, like, any other kind of store. That's why it's repeated over and over, because it's basically the same script with different kind of store. Some of this here, so candle, lamp, is actually showing some of her uh, diversity. So she's talking about Hanukkah and Diwali and Christmas. Um, and she does also mention computers. She's got Ada Lovelace even in here and one, uh, one mention. And then finally, the different animal terms she talks about. And uh, this caribou is actually reindeer um, from Christmas. So. <laughs> no pony. Oh, horses here, though. It's probably a synonym. So it's probably a synonym. It's probably a so it's probably a nuance of the uh, word net. That's probably a type of butterfly called the peacock butterfly. Expect um, some of the things we find here are a bit odd and they're related to word net. So the same thing here. I don't think she's talking about dolphin fish. This is probably the word dolphin, but it's probably a synonym within the word net ontology for dolphin fish. Mm -hmm. So there's some um, uh, mistakes I would say. So you can play with this online uh, at that URL. And here's where I was talking about if words don't fit in the, in the, in the structure, we actually just provide them on the side. Yes, please. Oh, so, uh, and for the depths of the node, you can't go any further sure. where there is granularity that you see because of WordNet limitation. Um, you only have whatever's available in WordNet, yes. So if you're able to expand WordNet, Yeah, and WordNet, I mean, we haven't found words that aren't in WordNet, really. Um, these words are not in WordNet because they're proper nouns, right? So some proper nouns actually are in WordNet, but most aren't, so that's why they're not included. But in terms of general nouns, they're pretty, it's pretty expansive coverage of the language. So this image is from the same Barbie? Second no, account. this is a different version. Because that's Alice in Wonderland. This is Alice in Wonderland, and this is uh, from our web-based version. I was showing you the Java version, um, the demo. OK. I'll try another experiment. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and wary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. To some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Any guesses about which one of these bars represents that? Excuse my dramatic reading. I'm not a. <laughs> Gut feeling. Don't overthink it. Bottom. So this is the premise of this work. So we've been looking at the relationship between words and the colors that they evoke. Uh, this is Edgar Allan Poe, The Raven, and it was the bottom. Just for reference, the top one is the vision and mission values of Coca-Cola, and the middle is Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens. <laughs> so this is coming from colleagues at the National Research Council of Canada who did a study um, that's been already published looking at the relationship between words and colors based on a crowdsourcing study of 12,000 um, participants, or no, 12,000 units of, of ratings. Uh, and uh, here's just an overview of the, of the data set. So you can explore this. Again, it's available online, lexachrome.com, where you can explore the language um, from the point of view of the colors that uh, it evokes. So here, this is just an overview of like how many, um, so the, you know, blue, green, red are higher than pink in terms of the color associations that people make. And we can drill down and start looking at the agreement level of individuals who have rated these colors. 
So um, 10 out of 10 people rated cowardly as being yellow, whereas only 7 out of 10 rated sunshine as being yellow. Perhaps, and if you drill into here, you can see that probably some other people may have said orange or white. I'm not sure. Um, they were only given these choices in the study. So uh, let me see here. I've got the live version of that as well. Um, so we can look at that and explore uh, the terms. And then we can see, uh, let's get to some with, something with some different disagreement. Oops, this one has a full agreement. Uh, there's a few different views. So here, uh, this is um, based on Roger's thesaurus, so organizing the language based on um, uh, word relations, meanings, similar to the WordNet um, or organization. And here, this is a little bit more experimental. Again, a sunburst diagram, looking at organizing that Roger's thesaurus view um, more spatially. What do you think this green area is over here? Well, it's sort of labeled, but. Woods so it's not woods and nature, though. It looks like it might be, but it's actually words relating to jealousy and possessive uh -huh. relations. Um, so those are really strongly. Woods and nature is down here. A lot of people think nature is brown. Um, do you want to put any uncertainty? Yes. So um, that's a good question. The height of this colored bar is the certainty. So um, this one is more uncertain than this one. More disagreement in this one than in this one. And the, the winning color is the color that's assigned. The winning hue is assigned to the bar. Keep track of which, which person labeled which word which way in the plus event. We don't have that information. We haven't used that information, but we might have it. Uh, but we don't use it. Um, so we can um, drill right down into the, So this one, you can see all the different uh, events, the labeling events that people had um, for this term. And it was green was winning, but it was less than 50% um, overall. So then the uh, sort of future of this project is to look at, I mean, it's a bit of a fun project, but I'm enjoying it. So one of the privileges of being a professor, I guess. Uh, we're looking at ways to uh, maybe even per allow somebody to do some really nuanced copy editing. Like if you were an advertising um, copywriter and you wanted to design, uh, so for example here, your Coca-Cola mission, state mission statement, maybe you shouldn't use the word invigorate here because it actually, or you shouldn't use the word refresh because it re invokes a, a blue feeling. Maybe we want to switch it to a synonym. Um, here invigorate being a synonym, these are cont context dependent synonyms that will fit in this space. Uh, has a 100% uh, red uh, connotation. So maybe just by swapping that out, you can actually, uh, you know, it's an untested theory, but um, people do spend so much effort on every single word in these kind of documents. So um, maybe actually this might be another tool that people could use to try and drive home that, uh, that feeling or that message. So this is a text editor for, for that. There's a few other views, but I don't have time to look at them today. Other work we're working on just quickly, so inspired by things like distant reading, Franco Moretti, uh, this project GeoMapper is still in progress. We're looking at can we pull out the space and movement of characters and texts? And the question that Franco Moretti was asking in his book was, um, does the distance that, that people move in texts uh, in English country novels, in his example, uh, expand as new transportation ca came online? Uh, and we're looking at it from an automated point of view. So if we look at text over time, can we see that the actual movement of characters is now getting bigger uh, from, say, the 1800s to the 1900s to the 2000s? OK, final one um, for today. So this is another one that's in progress under submission. Uh, we've been looking at uh, the ta a task-oriented design uh, based on an observational study of 14 poetry professional professionals annotating uh, a document. So they call this task close reading, reading a poem and annotating it carefully to understand it in detail. Traditional digital humanities approaches will do what I would call a monolithic visualization of the text. They would say, here are all the rhymes in the poem. And what we have found is that actually annotating is part of the cognitive process for somebody who, ha who wants to get a deep understanding about a particular document. Handing them a visualization of that document is not actually helpful. In some ways, it actually hinders because they just look at the overview, but they don't get the experience of discovering it for themselves. Um, so we got this from looking at 14 professionals doing two hours of annotation each, and then two people coded all of those videos. So very deep study. Um, finding 
uh, that the types of annotations that people make, I don't have time to get into the details, the space of the page that they generally make, make annotations on. Um, and we did this using Anoto Pen technology as well as videos. The resulting um, design is based on something we call implicit interaction, where we're now turning the annotation task into an interaction event for a digital system. So rather than having them learn a new way of annotating or a new way of interacting, we just let people do their normal annotations, and we're trying to guess what they mean by those annotations and provide them with support on the fly. So the annotation events become um, uh, interaction events. The interesting thing here is that the, uh, we, we don't mind if we have what we call false positives. If we think that they're circling rhymes and we provide them with information about rhymes on the fly, it doesn't matter if we show them extra information. It might support serendipitous discovery, as long as it's not disruptive. We don't want to disrupt the workflow. So we're providing all of the information on a secondary peripheral display that they could even turn off while they're doing their work. So I'll just show you a little brief video clip. So while doing an annotation on a printed poem, we are able to capture what exactly words are that they've annotated and provide information sort of on demand, just in time, uh, about those terms. So here, just uh, simply the, the words, uh, meanings, and, and history. What these dots were that are appearing here, while it was working, it was looking for other types of relationships between these terms, and then pulling up what we call other query tiles, so you can actually tap on these dots or click on them and pull up other visualizations about those terms, how they relate to each other, how their use relates, are they, do they sound the same, do they have similar meanings. Um, here, underlying another sentence, and we get more views of that. So now scrolling down, this is again on a peripheral display that can be ignored uh, until they want to look at it. We provide additional information about the relationships between the words in this annotation, or potentially the, the relationship between the words across annotations. Um, so I'll just, I'll just look at some views of that. So for example, alliteration, um, uh, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, we get some of the, um, and then we think the interesting concept here is that we, we think, well, these words have an alliterative relationship. They must be interested in alliteration. Let's show the rest of the alliteration in the poem. But if they want to continue doing it themselves, that's fine too. So the intersection between manual annotation and, and support is what we're interested in. So the tiles, we have a lot of dif different tiles that are customized to the poetry domain, but they could be for other areas. So things like synonyms, uh, this is more like a visualization showing synonym sets across the visualization. Um, and then bridging close and distant reading together. So close reading being I'm reading the document, really interested in this particular document. Distant reading being I'm looking at a corpus of documents, show me what's interesting in this corpus. If I use my close reading, the fact that I've annotated heaven and hell, and it, it recognizes that they're antonyms, and here are the other antonyms, what are the other Shakespearean sonnets that also contain this anonym pair? And then show me the other, uh, and then show me the details of the anonyms in those documents. So really getting to a place where we can augment the annotation process in a way that's not disruptive but expansive to uh, the um, poetry experts' normal process. Okay, so that's a preview. I hope I don't get in trouble with my co-authors. That's not yet published, but it's finished, so we're gonna. I don't mind telling you about it. So what do we do? There's a lot of different tools we use. Many of them you're probably familiar with or you could discover on your own. Things like, we were, I was already asked about tagging text or uh, stemming, inflection, removing stop words, those kind of things. A lot of different technologies that we're building on, so open source technologies as well as some proprietary um, resources, NLP resources. We make a lot of use of things like open data from things like, Twitter, becoming less open data from uh, areas like Twitter. Um, Tools like WordNet is a common one that we use, and various different new technologies like word to vec I would say, if you're working in this area, approach it with some caution. One of the top 20 or so um, terms that are more common in passwords than in regular English is team. And actually, this is not the word team. We thought, why are people talking about teams? It must be sports teams. But then we used our tool to actually look at the real passwords that contain the word team. And in fact, it was this, te amo Luis, Jesus te amo, Carlos te amo. It was actually not English. If you don't know, this is Spanish. I love you, right? I love Luis, I love um, Jesus. So the love theme was coming up again, but uh, we were finding the fact that there was a problem with our processing. So making sure that we investigate things that look a bit odd in order to confirm it, because the visualization doesn't give you that information. Same thing, this is Barbie. So, 
what Barbie is actually saying here is, well, I'm sure Chelsea would love to see your shell collection sometime. <laughs> I do not think she's meaning weaponry. <laughs> so we need to be, in, uh, you know, shells are all she talks about right now. Of course, we also need to understand that there are still ambiguities with relation to, word, uh, to part of speech tagging. Text is ambiguous. Understanding comes from our own knowledge. Language is a complex structure. Um, we don't know really where to start when it comes to big data sets. So if we have 500,000 documents or 5 million tweets, where do we start the investigation? That's still an open question. I think it's an interesting one. Um, we've got actual rendering issues. So things like screen real estate and fitting words in. I've got a student, Mariana Shim uh, Shimabukuru, who's working on this right now, trying to figure out, um, can we shorten words to make them fit without losing their uh, interpretability? What are the um, perceptual consequences of doing things like rounding words and putting them on angles and putting backgrounds behind them? Um, and does that uh, uh, you know, uh, affect our ability to use the visualizations? Also, we make a lot of assumptions about the fact that we can read data from the size of the word. And I don't actually know if that's fully true. Uh, we have a, a work, again, it's a work in progress, but we've done a, a, a perceptual study looking at the intersection between word length and word, word height and trying to see which of those is more important. Um, I'll give you a hint, word height is more important, which you probably expected, but there is an intersection, there is an interaction effect and word um, length can cause um, misreadings. Okay, sorry for going over, thank you for your patience. I will also thank my group, my students, and Natalie and Bongshin and Steve and others, Corey, for hosting today. Thanks. So most of what I've said is available online for you to play with. And uh, if it's not, you can contact me. And I'm sure we don't, you know, we don't have any problems providing stuff. So. If you did get the annotation piece published, what would be the next step to getting it into the hands of English teachers? Um, fixing it so it's not so buggy. <laughs> uh, actually, one of the other real constraints is that we really wanted to focus on um, the interaction between the paper and pen and the screen. And the paper and pen technology is actually proprietary. And we cannot sell the software we've created for it. Uh, and the company is really not very good at even like, like they basically don't even provide a developer kit anymore. We just happen to have one from years ago. Um, but I think it wouldn't work for the poetry professionals who really want paper. It's important. But you could do the same kind of approach on a tablet. I was a high school English teacher before mm -hmm. Microsoft, and I see that, and that would blow my students. Well, actually, nothing blows them away, but it would blow me away <laughs> I think, in the classroom. You know, That's when we did the when we studied this with, we went back to some of the fourteen people who started, uh, who we studied in the beginning, and showed them this, and several of them said, "You know, cool, but I don't think I would really use it because I know how to do all this stuff myself. I don't really need it. Give me some more sophisticated queries, and then I might use it." That's when we added on the expand out to a poetry database query. That one they're excited about. But what they did say, even for the basic queries, was you should use this for teaching. This is an excellent tool for teaching. So, so that is certainly, I think, uh, you know, the project's not dead. Certainly, really, we've submitted the paper, but I still want to work on it. I'm really excited about it. So, I think that would really help like little juniors in high school studying with Beth to really understand. Yeah, I mean, how, how it changes, how it's different from the rest of the canon. Yeah, yeah. It's really cool. I was talking to Corey today about uh, even the fact that sometimes students are taught about, uh, you know, highlighting the important parts or like even helping them know what to highlight or, you know, there's also some something here I think that we could even almost crowdsource if we had the logs of what, what people are doing with the same document, then we could even use that as a reference point to try and say, you didn't highlight the part that the other students all highlighted. So it's a really interesting space of work and annotation that I really like. You know. The key, me the key sort of controversial message of our paper is don't provide everything all at once, right? And and that's that's what I'm most excited about is sort of a take home message from that one. Okay, well I'm conscious of time, so if people want to hang around and chat, um, otherwise, should we let them go? <laughs> <laughs> no, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> <laughs>